Okay, so what's the idea? Well, you know, we've seen byte communication. We've seen, okay, sorry, we start with network layers, let's say. That's what you'll see, you know, that's what you see in Justine's class, for instance. Then we see the OS layer where we can, you know, switch between various network layers but are still perhaps providing things at the byte level. Then we saw that, you know, with some language help, we can have, uh, hmm, it should have been, so I, traditionally that's how things have been layered, but Java goes and creates an object communication layer. Okay? So we've seen that layer, and now we're going to see the layer above that. Um, so Java remote method implementation. Okay? So, um, so what's the trade-off? You know, the higher the layer, the more, you know, more, more abstraction. But the lower the layer, the more chance it is that it is in other systems also. So there's more interoperability possible. That's yet another dimension, interoperability, abstraction, flexibility. Okay. So what's the idea? The idea is that you have, we're calling it remote method implications. So we're going to look at OO languages. And you have a client object that is going to call a method in a server object through this RMI. Your regular languages, when your compiler, your compiler doesn't ever assume distribution. Your compiler just goes and assumes that the code is local, okay? And it's all in one address space. So somehow we have to build something into the compiler or maybe just a layer above the compiler, like in a pre-compiler or in some dynamic system we have to build that understands the language, though, okay? That will allow us to go and invoke methods on it. And ideally, we want to do this without making local method invocation any less efficient. Which means that I shouldn't have the compiler have to go and check on each, uh, each call whether I'm going to a remote or, 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 or a local thing. Right? This, this cost, I should not have to pay dynamically. Okay? Otherwise, my local method invocation just begins to and, and, and ideally also I'd like to go and keep the regular compiler, compiler guy who doesn't know distributed systems, let him write great comp compiler and, and build some layer above him, above this compiler to go and do my distribution. So that's some of those implicit goals here. What are the implicit goals that might be there in remote method communication? So you want to keep things efficient, you want to keep things modular, okay, and in this You can't completely hide the network layer. Like a local method invocation is very likely to succeed, whereas a uh, network is probably less likely on average. And then also you have uh, like overhead. Like if you set X, set Y, and set Z, and those are all remote method calls. So you have to go to the server and back. You know to set you know, in three times, which locally wouldn't be a big deal, then in either your design or you would have to have some sort of transaction semantics where if you say start transaction, object set X, set Y, set Z, end transaction, and it would do them all at once, you don't have the network overhead of every call. It's probably like little things that you, you can't just like gloss over completely, but I don't know how you would, how you would handle that into the API. That's interesting. Um, so have you seen anything of this call directly at all, or? Uh, uh... Um, I mean, not not exactly, but I do know that like Hibernate in Java, you like you you start a transaction and it will listen in, and then you can end it. So it's not like every time it's trying to update like the first name in the table, then the last name, then the birthday. You know, you just start it, and then it's like. It's one update so, you know, one of, let's call, let's call the Turing Award winner. One of her many achievements was the notion of transactions in distributed method calls. Okay. Uh, there was, she invented, you know, so you guys see in Java the notion of iterator? She invented iterator in the context of a language called Clue. So it's, this is really the Clue iterator. When she took Clue, which was a single site language, and, and went to Guardian which was a distributed language meant for transaction processing. So she was one of the first pioneers in combining database systems and programming languages. Okay? Now, transactions and efficiency are kind of actually 
they don't go together as you seem to be implying. They in fact yeah, conflict with I each mean, other. Yeah, transaction is probably too strong a word, but like bundling. Yeah, um, so bundling. So you wanted some kind of bundling where you maybe yeah. do some caching, or, you know, of that kind. But that's, so so you said you'll have to do some kind of error handling, and local calls may or may not succeed. When would a local call not succeed? Okay. So, so when, sorry. Okay. If it throws an exception, right? So it, it it didn't succeed in that case, perhaps. So perhaps it did succeed. It and exception was yeah. But um, when Liskov came into the picture, and then you know this guy Bruce Nelson, who I said wrote this thesis on remote procedure call, he and Liskov were, were, were the two pioneers in some sense, and they went alternative ways in how how transparent the RPC should. And transparent would mean. Like, does it, how much does it look like a local method? You can't tell. It's funny. My operating system teachers always said, "Why do they call it transparent when you can't tell?" You know, it's opaque when you can't tell, right? <laughs> so I have never understood that either. Ever since he planted that seed in my head, you know, I always look at transparent and wonder. So yeah. So you want, you want the syntax and semantics of method invocation to be as close as possible to local. And you hinted as to why the semantics at least may not be similar because things can fail. And generally, if the, if the, you know, the kind of failures we're talking of, both the caller and callee fail together, uh, unless you think of exception handling as being a kind of failure. But if you, know, you run out of memory, it's the whole program that goes. So if the callee failed, the caller also fails, so there's nobody observed that something failed. And except the end user, you know, we don't care about the end user. We just see a blue screen. And, and uh, whereas in remote procedure call, my computer can keep going on while that other computer has failed. So things become much more complex. Okay? So, okay, I gave away the answer, but that's okay. Forget about extends remote. Forget about throws remote exception, throws remote exception. Okay? Let's say I have a counter of that kind. I created this counter, I was going to edit it off, and I didn't. And I looked at this slide so many times, but I never saw this. Okay. Um, so th let's go and see how I might just take a counter object, see how it will be defined locally, and see what it might be, how it might be defined remotely. Okay. So we just take this simple example to understand. Okay. So this is my counter, absence all this remote stuff. And here is my class that implements the counter, and it does the obvious thing. It keeps a variable to hold the counter, it's got to get value, increment, and I've overridden the two string method, and I've overridden the equals method. Okay? And the equals method, method you know, checks if the value I got is a counter or not. If it's not, we know it, they're not equal. Otherwise, it goes and checks if the values are the same. Okay? If we are writing classes in a proper way, that's what we would do. We would override the counter. Okay? Okay, now that you imagine that you didn't see all of the stuff I showed you earlier, uh, how would you go and extend this program to make it distributed? <laughs> okay, so how we saw how we might have to extend the interface. And why did we put all that stuff there? Why did we go and say throws remote exception? Something could go wrong. So we know that all the things that can go wrong in local, things will still go wrong, okay? So we have those exceptions. Plus, we added another exception saying, you know, the network, the machine thing. The poor program was, was going to do the value correctly. It's just these extraneous things that came around. Yeah. Is, uh, do you know, just off the top of your head, is remote exception checked? Or okay, is so that is going to be my question to you uh, next. At least I can ask that question now. Should it be checked or not checked? Yeah. Why checked? What's the philosophy behind it? Dividing things into checked and not checked. Check forces you to deal with it. So, 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 and, 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 and what is the criteria used to determine when you should be forced and when you should not be forced? I mean, when you're defining a new exception, how do you decide whether you're going to make it checked or not checked? I mean, we know how to do it, but how do we decide which way to go? Well, you can, if you create a uh, subclass runtime exception. So that's how we do it, right? right. But, and that's why, yes. Yeah, so. No, 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 no. So we've got two classes right. of exceptions. How we go and put exception to this class versus that class is a orthogonal issue. Yeah. 
we make it a subclass directly of runtime exception, of runtime exception, or we make it a subclass directly of exception. You know, that's sort of the philosophy. But how do we pick which way are we going to subclass? How well can you can survive? So some exceptions are more exceptional than others or more dire than others. That's the criteria. Some exceptions happen due to programmer errors, like you know, null pointer exceptions or number format exceptions. Others will happen due to real world hardware failures that the programmer has to control and when they from classic different languages. So there's no other fix to that problem. Like a null pointer exception can be fixed by checking if it's equal to null. Okay, so you're giving very good. That's a very good answer. So the whole idea is that we don't want to. We don't want. We know how painful it is to go and say throws exception, catch exception. So of course, Eclipse will say, "Should I put a try catch block around it?" And you say, "Go ahead." You know, <laughs> not a problem. Uh, but we don't. That's still a pain, right? So the careful programmer shouldn't have to pay the cost. Okay, that's the philosophy. So the careful programmer can ca program very carefully and avoid certain kinds of exceptions, such as null pointer exceptions caused by internal errors. Null pointer could, exceptions could be caused by some other factor also. Okay? That's what the programmer can control. And some exceptions the programmer can't control, which may depend on the hardware, may depend. What about the file exceptions? Are they checked or unchecked? I would say checked. Checked, because they depend, because the errors could be caused by? The hardware IO class. Or the end user. The end user went and said end of file when you know the program is expecting some input. Okay, or or so so, um, so so that is the end user, the network, external factors. So now we have these other factors that are contributing to the remote method invocation. That you know it could be the hardware failing, it could be the network failing, and so we make it check. So how does sort of any near at any level? Stack below Java RMI layer, does that instantly come up to a runtime here, or will it internally do something like attempt multiple times if there's some like say there's a network error and you know, does Java say maybe I'll try again? Or would it simply say, hey, consumer of this, I had a, a So what do you think? Error. So what do you think? I, I'm gonna assume they give more control to the user by, by saying, hey, there's an error in the stack. So we are implemented so implement on top of TCP IP. Right, of course, and that's reliable transport. So, but at some point, it even it realizes that think the other side is dead. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So at that point, it'll report up, up and say, you know what, my timeout has expired. So it's all a timeout issue. Right. And when it times out, the programmer is allowed to. The programmer start. can be the one who tries again. Right. And what do they do? How many of you guys do other things other than? I really want to know. Honest answer. How many of you do guys do things other than print stack trace, which an interpreter would do? So what kind of things have you guys done to recover from exceptions? Get us. Sorry? Get us. And then do what? Then, uh, I mean, then you could have multiple try catch blocks, but in some cases. So what are some examples of things, recovery things you've done beyond just reporting the error? Uh, well, not just recovery. Hmm? Um, I'm curious because I really want to. You can catch unchecked exceptions and deal with them, like number format. Okay, so that's, that's good. That's, so that's good. So the user goes and enters wrong the input. Most of the time, if there's a possibility of getting a runtime exception like that, we would try to to address to put a code path in for it. So in, in a situation like that, we might run it through a regular expression or something. If you try to make the code pass like possible. Yeah, the number format one with an end user makes a mistake, and that's not really an exception because you can expect the user to go and make the mistake. I mean, right. you know, but it just so happens that if you use parsint, it'll throw an exception. It won't return an error code. And so, you know, you have to go and do something like that. And in a couple of cases, you have IO exceptions you want to, if the file is Okay, that's good. Those are good examples. You try different, you cycle through a list of different errors and until all of them are exhausted, you give them yeah. 
that bank out. Okay. Normally, it's, it's just yeah. Clean up. Yeah, it's logging that's, and clean up for the most part. With yeah. Exception. That's like if you if you have something that you're likely to get, you should probably code for it. If you get an exception you haven't coded for, you probably can just log it and clean up and, and make sure the program doesn't crash. So the user can try again if they want to and change it. And they can yeah, okay. What's fun is cleaning up. When, or what's fun is recovering from a failure and cleaning up. <laughs> yeah. that, that's, uh, yeah. I just despise that. Well, why, why would you clean up if you recovered? What's that? Why would you clean up if you recovered? No, say you're, you're, you're cleaning up from some failure, and at some, some point in your cleanup, you have, have another exception. <laughs> some, some other way. Right. But properly clean up the job, it's like there's try catches in the try. Finally. Catches, exactly. old checks. I mean, exactly. it's like to actually do it right is uh, a in, in this last assignment, we. Uh, there was an IO exception that we had to like close the channel and cancel the key. And key got cancelled was another IO exception. So at that point we just closed close the IO exception. So, so, <laughs> so key the key which key are you talking about? Selection key, selection selector, the key that's registered. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That one, that one, that one. Okay. okay. So I'm obviously in keyboard input. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So We've seen how the counter interface must change. We must now create a new kind of counter interface. Okay. We can't inherit from it. We just, you know, we've got different headers right now. What about the class? How would it change in the RMI case? Oh, by the way, so we know why there was remote method invocation. Yeah, yeah. Exception. Why was the word remote there? Why was the interface extending remote? So it's marking. It's marking it. So it says it can be remotely done, and so we can prop perhaps do some extra work for that kind of interface, so that we don't pay the cost for non-remote interfaces. Okay, we'll see why. why it's, okay, and and how do you f so how do you f uh, so I can declare something to be of type remote. So, so and then how do I force a method in, in the counter interface to have that throws exception in it. How does Java force that to happen? You want that to happen, right? Any, because any remote method can have that exception. So that's not just by convention. Yeah, if you don't do it, what's going to happen? I mean, normally within the language, you're not required to Throws. So, to, yeah, but it doesn't say, oh, your declaration has to look like this if the interface is empty. I don't know if a way you can say, oh, for every, say, public method in the class that implements this, unless they tie into the compiler, like the interface ties into the compiler. Don't move through. It doesn't so, basically, when you declare an interface to be an extension of remote, then Java makes sure that every method in that interface throws remote exception. If you try to, or rather, I think what you're saying is it does it at runtime, probably. Yeah, I've forgotten. Actually, there's a there's a there's a compile time and a runtime component to it. So when it does it at runtime, the behavior you're talking about happens. But there's also a pre there's also a compile time uh, compile time. We'll talk. We'll see that later. So whenever Java goes and processes the word remote, whether a runtime or compile time. Uh, it goes and makes sure that that method throws an exception. Otherwise, it won't let the method be called. So this is this is a special exception in that it has compiler time. Okay. Or precompiler. Yeah. One of these two things. Or reflection. It's either precompiler or reflection. Yeah. One of these two things are working together to do that. Okay. So now, how will my class change? My class a counter implements right now the counter without the remote stuff that you saw. Okay. And now it should implement a remote counter. And what else should change in the class? Okay. Trick question. I was expecting you guys to all say this. So every method here should go and say it throws remote exception. Every method here that's in, that's part of the remote counter should have throws remote exception. Are we trying to make it? Uh, we're trying to make it easy and safe. So would remote just take care of that if it's required? 
won't remorse just take care of that? Let's think about it. First thing, let's try to figure this out. If, if an interface method says throws exception, does the method in the class have to also say throws exception? In general, forget about remote, forget about remote, oh. in general, in Java. Yeah, it, it's just compiled Yeah, if it's a check yeah. exception, it's part of the method. 401 from the wrong person. Uh, in 401, we go into this a lot. If the method in the class says throws remote exception, does the method in the interface have to say throws remote exception? Th throws exception? Yes. So it's equal. They have to be, the method headers have to be equal? Okay. Why? And that's getting to a deep question right now. So that's, that's part of the contract. The contract says in the interface, when this method is called, I may throw this exception. It's not going to be always occur, right? Right. I may throw this exception. Oh. Okay. And my class says, I'm an implementation. I guarantee you I don't throw this exception. Could such a class implement that interface? Yes. May, may throw an exception. Not throwing is also may throw an exception. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not throwing is consistent with that. It's like the, the analogy I give to 401 students is that, you know, if you're good and you say you're bad, nobody's going to complain when you're, you know, when you're good. Say, why didn't you be, why weren't you bad? You said you'd be bad. I said I'm a lousy teacher, you know, nobody's going to complain now. But if I say I'm a great teacher and I don't do well, you're going to say what? What you promise is not true. Or when I go and put in a drug the side effects and they don't happen, are you going to complain? No, I was relying on those side effects. I want this anti-cholesterol medicine to go and do my exams better, you know. <laughs> so, to, so, so, you know, the interface can say all kinds of bad things are happening. But a particular implementation can say, you know what, I'm really good and I prevented those bad things from happening. And I still implement the interface because the guy who's going to use the interface is ready for these errors. So he can still use my method. He's ready for these errors and I didn't throw any errors. He's still ready for my method. The other way around is trickier. The interface user expects no exception. You go and throw an exception. The guy's not even ready for that exception. Okay? So I can go in Java and say implements remote counter and it's legal Java. Okay? Now, is it true that this method is not throwing a remote exception? Is it? Do you see throwing a remote exception? Is there any code here that's throwing a remote exception? Who's throwing the remote inspection, uh, exception? That underlying network layer. That's not even part of this counter. That's throwing the remote exception. Okay, so this is going in. Just talk, talking about you know the behavior when the counter is used directly. You're not going to use this class directly in remotely. You're going to use that interface directly, but you're not going to use this class directly. So if you're going to use this class directly, you are probably on the same. You are definitely on the same machine. In which case, you know why should you be ready to catch its funny exceptions? The, the, these funny exceptions. You can go. Okay, so I'm getting ahead. Okay, so what's going to happen? And this is what's really going to happen. You're not going to call that object method directly. What you're going to do is, and since we are, we do, we want the existing compiler to work, we fool the external compiler. Okay, by going and making calls to some local proxy object, which now handles communication with the remote object. So as far as the compiler is concerned you are actually calling a local method. It just so happens that the local object method forwards. So that's, that's, that's the picture, which means you are never calling this instance directly. You're calling that instance, which happens to implement the same interface as this guy, okay? But an interface that throws remote exception. So this guy has to handle remote exception, but not somebody who calls this directly. So you understand the, con I mean, I assume you guys all knew there was a proxy object somewhere, right? That's just auto-generating. Okay, so that's somehow under the covers. You don't have to worry about it, but you can if you want to.
and you will. <laughs> Some point in the future. <laughs> For now, you don't. Okay, so in next assignment, you have to worry not at all about it. Okay? Proxy is generated by the RMI system. Okay? So then the question is, of course, how do you go and connect them? Okay? And, you know, you've got, uh, you've got, you've got basically local references. So I don't know if my slides are a little out of order. So by, by doing this architecture, I guess we'll talk about how they're connected later, uh, your local method invocations look like remote method invocations with the caveat that your remote method invocations will always have to handle a special kind of exception. So they look like local method in uh, methods, but it so happens there's a special kind of exception thrown by them. Okay? And so the caller is distribution aware. The caller for remote method, is it is distribution aware? If by caller you mean the proxy object? No, I mean this time. Oh. Well, wouldn't you have to catch the remote exception? Okay. And the, and, 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 the, and the guy who defined the object? Does he have to be aware of distribution? Or is the one providing the interface? He's the one providing the interface which throws the remote. So because it's checked, both are aware. That's why I'm saying this. Okay. So you have a check remote exception. It must catch this. I had this previous slide there. Just ignore it. I'll try to remove it. So method declaration must indicate it may throw remote exception in header. And this occurs because of network or server error. So this is out of your control. That's why it's checked. Okay. Something the client programmer cannot control. So it's checked. And how to make the programmer put those flaws? It must go and label methods as remotely invocable. And again, we're going to use our interface-based tagging. Okay, we could use other mechanisms also. So if some interface is remote, then every method in the class interface should be labeled as, is labeled as remote implicitly. And Java ensures at either compile time or runtime, depending on the implementation we use, that these methods will actually have that clause in the in their in, in the headers. Okay. Okay. So you know. Uh, this is my local counter. I got it right here. I knew I'd done, I'd done some editing somewhere. And this is my my uh, distributed RMI counter. It extends remote, and I have to go and put these two things in there. Okay? And in the case of the class, I have I have my local counter, and I can just go. So the class header need not have throws class as interfaces used by client. What about the equals method? Does that have to change? Uh, yeah, you probably have to put in a lot of checking for deceptions. Well, look at this thing here. So I, I converted, I went from my counter interface to a remote counter interface. So I have another interface now. So I'm checking here, it's an instance of? Ooh, but it might not be, because if it's being sent over the socket, it could be a remote counter. It could be a remote counter. I'm going to have this class implement both interfaces, counter and remote counter. It can do that. It is a remote counter, not a sub-interface. Okay, things will get very accept very uh, interface is a set of method headers. And method header, we mean really the name and the signatures. Okay. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to create a distributed inheriting RMI counter. You know, there's always inheritance or delegation, so I'm being very specific here. And it implements distributed RMI counter. And uh, I um, actually could implement, so I guess I'm not making it implement counter also. Counter is being implemented by my, my superclass. Okay? So I'm implementing that interface also. Okay? And I, what am I doing here? Um, if it is not an instance of distributed RMI counter, I'm saying do whatever my superclass does. Okay? And that superclass is going to check if it's an instance of counter. 
and otherwise I'm going to go and check if my value equals the get value and cast it to a distributed RMI counter. Okay, so basically this object is equal to either a counter object or a distributed RMI counter. This class implements both interfaces. I need both of these things to go through. My superclass is checking for counter, I check for distributed. This equals method is going to be a very important method. I put it deliberately here because we don't know how it behaves really in front of RMI, RMI object. Okay. Questions? Why is that not an equal method? Why is this not? So, so as a genius programmer, I have an, a counter before, right? And that counter is a superclass. So it, don't, it doesn't know about distributed on my counter. I understand. That line, return super dot equals other object, with it, it equals for any. Oh, why didn't they put it? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, they always return false, right? Equals always returns false in class object. If it's not equals equals, it returns false. Yeah, if it's not the same instance. It's, an object will return false. So I think it's okay, yeah. Okay, but yeah, you have to write code like this always. Uh, and typically you would just go and say, if they're not an instance of this, return false. But I'm putting super because I know my super guy can go in. Check for count. So this is actually a little atypical. Otherwise, you you just return false. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the inherited method is very important. That all the inherited methods are implementing two inter, two uh, are in, implementing two different method headers. One from one counter, one from another. Okay, now this awareness, uh, this transparency thing is wonderful till you want flexibility. What if I want to know in my counter which client is calling me? Would you ever want to know though? Can you think of applications in which you want to know? Do you want to know in your simulation which client is calling it? Because Uh, okay, so so maybe maybe that would be a reason. Well, well no, because you have to broadcast to all the clients, so you have some have to have some way of getting in touch with those clients again. Otherwise, how do you send your command? I mean, your client said like they're pulling the method, right? You have data yet, you have data yet, but it's an efficient. Yeah, but basically, you know, like you said, that you might want to go and have a scheme where, based on who sent you the data. You know, you either send it back to them or not, send something, echo back or not. I think that's, that's an example. Otherwise, if you didn't have this awareness, you'd have to send with the client, you know, here's my name, here's who I am, so they don't send it back to me. Um, and from an end user point of view, is that ever, use, ever useful? Have you ever, you guys, when you use Google Docs or collaborative editing? Yes, that way you know who to blame. Or who to give credit to? Your collaborators are wonderful. <laughs> so, so uh, uh, yeah. So you might want to provide some kind of user awareness where you go in. Uh, so, so at that point, the identity might be important. So, do you think uh, these goals in Java of having transparency, having things look like local execution, and this awareness? I mean, the fact that you may want to sometimes be aware of the client. Do they? Conflict with each other, or can we do something? Have a cake and eat it too. High level and flexible. RMI has a solution for that. Think about it. Think how hard it is to be an infrastructure designer. So the method is being called. 
and the bottommost collar there is a special kind of entity. It's being called by some by some uh, remote. Uh, so who's who's a security person here? Find, find security person. Huh? Like an ongoing researcher? Yeah, or somebody who knows something about Java security. No? You guys know that when um, uh, methods are called uh, an applet or an app, a web browser, for instance, can it call arbitrary methods in your on your computer? Can it write to the file system? Can it delete files? Depends on whether it's exporting a bug in Java or not. So by default, should should some downloaded code, supposing some code is downloaded from a server in a it, browser, it can prompt you to say, should I allow read or write access? Um, it's not disallowed explicitly, but it's a, a user request sort of pop-up thing. Isn't there the cross-domain working policy or something that does like good stuff for all those? So there's something called a sandbox. Thing. Yeah, yeah, your sandbox. Yeah, yeah, but by default, the sandbox and what happens there that you know where you were called from. Okay, somehow you can look at the stack and see how you were called. And based on how you were called, you can get some information. So that's what they do. They say, okay, am I called locally? Am I called distributedly? There are different loaders involved, as it turns out. And, and the similar kind of thing is here that, you know, the initial caller is different from the caller of a local case. Okay, ultimately, this is being called by some thread. You guys have written these selected threads, right? Some selected thread of yours is going to call this method when you when you go and uh, build build RMI on top of your NIO if you do it. Okay. You won't call it, but 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 ultimately it is something like the selected thread that's going and making a remote method invocation. So you can know where you came from. You can know what channel there was. I mean, after all, you know, you guys in your selected thread know, you know, which which channel the message got received on. So there is that awareness in the system. The question is how to explore it, explore, give it, and just make, give them a system call. It says, am, who am, who's calling me right now? Okay. So you can just say, give me the host of the client who's just calling me. Okay. It's not in a parameter. The method invocation looks the same. But if you want this awareness, you can find that out. Just the host, nothing else. If you have, in your case, it's not going to help you because you guys are going to run everything on one host. But if the host name is unique, you know something about the call. Okay? So that's something that people don't know about typically. But that's, that, that's one way to get color, some awareness okay. for those who need it without forcing everybody to be aware. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not sure if I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm just trying to think of the semantics of all this. How exactly do you handle or remove a method to return a result? Do you have to serialize the return result? Implicitly and deliver it to the client. Maybe you serialize it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you could uh, send a pointer to the result. Okay, so we just look into that. But yeah, okay. I'm getting a little ahead. But Sorry. but but yeah, you could serialize. Let's say by default you're going to serialize the result, or you're going to uh, serialize the parameters also. That's why I talked to data communication earlier, because you cannot understand remote method invocation without understanding what is being sent. Okay. That's a very. I think I've got parameter passing somewhere soon. Okay, so there's this little method that you can use. Okay, so how is this local proxy magically introduced into your? It's created by the system, but how does how does this appear in your client's address space? For those of you who've done as an instance of the interface. As an instance of the interface, and as an instance of this particular class that is hidden from you, which, whose name is hidden from you because you never instantiate the class. Is it a hidden subclass? It's not quite a subclass. It could be a class that you just generated automatically. You can you can just compile code dynamically in Java. It could be anything. Okay, it's actually a very interesting class. We'll go and see it at some. You generate proxies. You can you can yourself generate proxies for any class. By the way, you want to replace, change the behavior of some class, just generate a proxy for it, and give a reference to the proxy. So there's a lot of fun stuff you can do in Java. So that's involved somewhere, okay? Uh, but okay, so you think that's how the proxy is generated? This end or this end? Uh, 
once for everyone, and you can just get it. Like, if the server wants to put itself out there, it's just this thing it needs or an object, and it sends a repository for you to use the whole tab, start the tab proxy. And if it's nice, you just go in and say, is this proxy available? Just put it out. Okay. So, this, this, this situation is not unlike the situation we saw with sockets or server channels. You've got two local objects that have to be bound to each other somehow. We saw that we use external names to do the binding. <coughs> One guy goes and says, um, bind? Rebind? It's bind. Huh? Bind. bind. No, not in RMI. In sockets, what is it? Even in RMI, it's bind. It's bind, right? And, and, then bind. and then the other guy, basically somebody registers, somebody looks up. Okay? And there's some well known place to do this thing. And in the case of s sockets and uh, socket channels, that well-known process is on the on the server server machine. Okay. Here, that well-known well -known process could be anywhere, okay. and you can specify which host it should be on. So basically, you need a name server, you need external names, and uh, that's. So what happens is that a proxy of this object. Is created here. Okay, when you do something like what he said, export object. Okay, a serialized copy of the proxy is registered with the name server, and a serialized copy of that proxy is fetched here. So the serialized the serialization here is of the code, not the data that the class is holding. Or well, the proxy is not going to hold much data, no, right? It's, it's, I mean, is, is this a sharing of Java bytes? Uh, so, sharing of Java byte code is the byte code sent along with that? You're saying? Yeah, that's what I'm at. Like when you say it's serialized down, is it some sort of sort of class definition? So these includes? these things are all instances of a class called proxy, okay. which exists in every every method system. So this just has information in it on how to contact the server. Okay, so it'll have the server port number, it'll have the server host, it has the kind of information that's required for it to send messages across. That's what it basically has. Is also the matter of the remote interface being present on both ends or yeah. just on one end? And if it's on present only on one end, it should be by nine. No, no, the remote interface has to be at this end, otherwise how did I compile my program? The class may or may not be present. Yeah, the interface has to be. Interface has to be listed, right? But the interface can be loaded at runtime. No, but at compile time, how did I even write my code? The class can be loaded at runtime. Yeah. Interface is not really thing loaded. It's just it almost goes away after compile time. In fact, does go away after compile. Time. Okay. So, uh, okay. So we have you know basic problem: objects shared ob processes need to share objects. Need to have external name. We've gone through this before. And uh, we have this binding, and so uh, so this is what I said earlier. So how to connect the two? How exactly? And and it's done through uh, serialized proxies. And here we go. So we have an RMI registry object. Now we have a recursive problem. How do we get in touch with that object to get hold of other objects? Because that object is remote to at least one of caller and colleague. And it may be remote to both of them. Okay, so that there's some magic to do. This RMI registry is just built in. We have system calls to talk to it. We don't talk to it through RMI. Okay, but conceptually there is a name server. Okay, and the caller goes and fetches the proxy, and the caller goes and registers the proxy. That's basically what's happening. Okay, uh, and here's the exact routine. Okay, so you just say registry dot rebind. Da, 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 da. Okay, a name and object. It has to be a remote. Okay, you can't register a non-remote object. So we see how this is being used as a type right now. So it's good. Remote should be a type because we're going to use. You know, you're going to exploit the fact that this is an instance of remote. Okay, and rebind. And this will go and rebind with uh, with with the registry, and that is the one that's used to look up. So there are these magic methods that just happen. They're static methods. And underneath there's some remote communication happening. But it's not built over the RMI layer. So we, we just basically bootstrapping things on top of this. Okay. 
so only instance of remote can be registered. And, and here's an interesting thing. So you're registering with it an object, which can be of some class C. This could be a, a third process that's different from both the client and the remote. And, and so what this is saying is uh, the specific subtype that you're sending across, this particular registry should have in its class path that. There are ways to dynamically load things, but that's not by default. So by default, if you're going to run a registry, you make sure that this class path is the class path of your project. Okay, that's extremely important. Just as a detail. I mean, I've done it many times, but it was not, and I get this error. Okay, so how to start the RMI registry and how to get reference to the name server itself. And we see here how that's done. So there, we have this bootstrapping problem I said, right? How do you talk to the, we use these static methods, but what is, what's really happening? At the so you start a re registry, and typically the, the default port for it is 109. So that's its process that you can start. You can start it as part of the server or you start as a separate process. Okay, in all my examples, I will show you it's a separate process. Okay? So uh, I've gone and set the class path to be my class path. You know, I'm just saying that, look, I've, I've set the class path to what I want in my particular example so that I don't get these, I don't get problems when I store the object. And what I can do is, uh, Actually, I, I was wrong there. Those, those are not static methods. They were, there's, they were actually instance methods invoked on an instance of registry. You have static methods to create the registry. Okay? So you can always say, create registry at this port, at this machine with this port number. Okay? And then you can say, get registry at this host and this port. So you get an instance of, of the registry class I showed you earlier, which had instance methods, not static methods. I was wrong there. And then you can use this, this particular, these particular methods to go and bind every bind. Okay? So if you're the server, you will probably go and have a, a registry right on your host. Okay? So you will just say create registry at your host. And the client will know your host name, will know the port number, and will say get registry that host and port number. Now they're talking to the same registry, and whatever you, objects you register, register with that registry are, can be fetched by the other one. Okay, and you, you've got code here. So here's my, uh, I've got a couple of minutes left. Here is my RMA registry starter. I've got locate registry, uh, regist dot create registry at 1099. I'm just saying here's the port number. I'm not, I'm not, so I don't have to go and go through the command line and go and ex execute that code. Okay, and I can just start a regular program that goes and becomes an RMI registry process. And this can be done by the server also, again, you know, and many of the examples you see in your, in your tutorials will be that way. I say, and then I'm doing something funny here. Anybody see why I did that? Are you just trying to block? Just trying to block for the sake of it? I'm trying not to. You're trying to keep alive. I'm trying not to die. Otherwise the process is. This, this, by the way, this is a very fundamental question, you know. When you create a frame, when the main program, cre main method creates a frame and say a set visible, and then you execute the end of main, what happens? Return Sorry? Return and the process is done, gone? Uh, no. no this is red, so, it's this, this, oh, okay. so you keep alive. There's something underneath that keeps alive and says, oh, you set that oh. frame visible. Okay, I'll keep you alive. About, like, Windows, yeah, I'm just yeah. saying that these questions arise all the time. And here's another situation where I have this object registered. It's really a database, but I'm, mod I'm modeling the database as a process in one which you can invoke methods. There's this whole duality between processes and modules, okay? And which you've seen in your operating system courses, perhaps, okay? And so I'm just trying to keep the guy alive, okay? And if you guys create a separate process, you'll have to do something like this, something to just not die. Uh, so again, typically it started as part of the server process, but you can have a separate process here. And uh, then you can go and make these calls that I look up and rebind on this. And 
uh, RMI registry simply just stores what was sent to it by rebind. So you go and make a rebind call on it. Basically, that sends this object with, along with the name. You're sending a proxy. You just keep the proxy copy. And look up, sends a copy of the proxy. Okay. Let's just stop here.